I want to welcome you to a session for Frontier Nursing University. Um, I'm Tanya Nicholson. I'm the department chair of Midwifery and Women's Health. And so this is just a chance for me to give you some general information about our nurse midwifery program, try to answer any questions you might have. And um, we have some guests from Frontier here. So I'm gonna just, uh, I'm gonna miss some of you guys cause I won't, I'm looking at the slides and might not see everybody, but I think we've got Rainy Boggs who is in charge of admissions. Rainy, you wanna give a little wave? And Susan Morgan, who is an admissions counselor. Stephanie Boyd, who is in charge of our clinical advising unit. And who am I missing? I, I would like to invite everybody to turn your cameras on. Don't feel like you have to, but we'd love to see your faces. And um, I will be perfectly honest and tell you, I'm staring straight at the slide because that's all I can look at. But Stephanie and uh, Rainey and the other folks on the Susan that are on this call, they're gonna help me if you have a question. Um, they're gonna kind of help me um, to manage those because I might not miss them as I'm talking. So I'm gonna share with you lots of information tonight, but the thing I wanna start with is kind of the core at who we are as Frontier. So I know you can read, but our um, mission statement guides everything that we do. And our mission statement is that we are to provide accessible nurse midwifery and nurse practitioner education to prepare competent, entrepreneurial, ethical, and compassionate leaders in primary care to serve, <coughs> pardon me, all individuals with an emphasis on women and families in diverse rural and underserved populations. So I hope that speaks to you because it kind of just in, encapsulates in a short few sentences what guides us as we make decisions, who we wanna be when we grow up, if you wanna look at it that way, and um, what we think is important. So these are the important things about who we are. So please, if you are um, joining us, please mute your um, sound unless you are actively talking or asking a question. It just helps with the background noise. We invite you to turn your cameras on if you would like to. We'd love to see your faces. And again, I'm Tanya Nicholson. I'm the Department Chair of Midwifery and Women's Health. And this is our mission statement. You know, um, I say over and over when people ask me about what I do, who are you, Tanya, as a midwife? What does that mean? And what I say is I am so blessed and lucky to do what I do because it is what drives me. It is what I love. I love caring for families and for women. I love being at births. I love GYN care. And I would choose it again and again and again and twice on Sunday. I have never had one moment of regret at becoming a midwife. Are the hours long and crazy? Oh, yes, they are. But when I jump in my car on a crazy day, when I'm tired on Sunday night, I've been on call for the weekend, and I know I've got a full day of my regular job at the university on Monday. Um, so I do a little bit of part-time work in clinic. When I get that call in the middle of the night, Sunday night, and I'm already tired, sometimes I get in the car and as I'm getting myself together, I think, oh my word, I'm so exhausted. And by the time I get to where I'm going, I'm thinking, how is it that I could get paid to do something that I love so much? So I really feel that, um, Living your passion is important. So as we talk about what do you want to do with the rest of your life, look for something that is truly your calling and your passion. Um, if you love your work, you never work a day in your life or something like that. That's what people say, and I believe it. So here's some words that I think really describe who a midwife is. So I assume that you're on this call because you have some interest in this. Maybe you completely know what a midwife is. Maybe you work with midwives in your nursing career, but maybe you don't. Maybe you're a little confused, and I'm going to admit my transparency and tell you that I had never met a midwife when I decided to be one. I didn't know a midwife. I had never met one in person. To be perfectly honest, I wasn't sure if it was legal. Um, I was glad to find out it was. And, but something inside of me said that the kind of care that I was witnessing was not all there is to pregnancy, birth, and gynecologic care. That there was more 
to it, that it had more potential than that, that it could impact families in ways beyond just um, the physiologic, but that it could change their lives. And in changing, working to work with women and help to impact their lives, it has impacted me. Um, at Frontier, we have uh, multiple degree options there in time frame. So what I want you to gather from this information is that when students come in to become a nurse midwife, they come in and do their masters of science in nursing, or they come in and do a postgraduate if they're already, say a nurse practitioner of another sort and want to also become a midwife. And then they can also go on and get their doctor of nursing practice. Now, currently, um, all of the states in the United States require a master's to practice nurse midwifery. We anticipate down the line that the doctorate will be a requirement. So we offer a doctorate of nursing practice as well. Many of our students come in and from the beginning, they know they're gonna get the doctorate. So they do the master's and then they just roll straight on into the doctorate. Um, the master's takes anywhere from two to three years, depending on how many courses at a time you take, how busy your clinical site is, how you move along, and to be honest, what happens in your life too. Our postgraduate certificate, so for somebody who's already a nurse practitioner and adding their nurse midwifery, anywhere from one to a year and a half, depending on exactly what they've got to take, how many courses they take, how busy their site is. And then after the master's is completed, if you choose to continue to the doctorate, which we recommend this picture, some of our doctoral graduates a few years ago, um, you can do the companion DNP is what we call it. Um, so it's that you've taken some of the coursework during your master's that's gonna count towards your doctorate. So you move into the doctorate and it takes an additional 15 to 18 months or so. Now, I wanna tell you about life as a nurse midwife. So I'll tell you this, a little bit of the story of this picture. This is a birth that I attended approximately maybe nine months to a year ago. And um, one of the lessons, and this is a free lesson to you guys, whether uh, as a nurse or a nurse midwife, free lesson right here. Um, you give excellent care every single time, every single patient, every single woman, every single birth, and even if you have a preconceived notion about what you think is gonna happen, you still give that excellent care every time. So I'm gonna be very transparent here and tell you the story of this baby father and mother triad here. So this woman had been laboring, very um, sweet young girl that had had, uh, I believe two previous children, at least one, this was not her first baby. Uh, she had two previous children. And this was her, I, I don't remember if it was her husband's significant other, father of the baby. And I initially, when I looked at him, now I'm from Georgia, in case you have not noticed in the accent, when I first looked at him, I made some assumptions that he was a little country guy and he's got his little Tumpy's roofing hat there. He works for a roofing company. And I made the assumption that he was not going to be very interested in this birth. Okay, note to self, don't do that. You don't do that, right? None of you do that. Y'all never done anything like that. Well, I kind of made that assumption. And, but fortunately, even though I made that assumption, I did things just like I always do them. So I said, this particular um, lady had an epidural. So as we got closer to time for the baby to be born, I said, which I always say, daddy, how involved do you want to be? And he said, like, what do you mean? said, well, you can be up at the head of the bed holding mama's hand. You can be down here holding a leg. If you want to put gloves on and um, catch this baby, you can do that. Well, his eyes got wide and he was like, really? I'm like, sure. And so I said, hold your hands up. And he did. And I said, okay, somebody get me a size eight, eight and a half glove. So he comes over, he puts the gloves on. He does a great job helping with the birth. You can see there. Um, and the mom later told me that he constantly talks about it and he says that he delivered the baby. And she says, I, she says that she says, um, I had a little something to do with it too, meaning the mama. <laughs> and uh, yep, you did your hard work, hard work for everybody. And she says that although he of course loves all of his children, that he takes an ownership in this birth that's different because of his level of involvement. 
I could have missed that for this family. I could have missed it for myself because it was a lesson to me as well. So the cheap free lesson here that you get is you give excellent care every single time. Whether you're in the situation that you're comfortable with or not, as the bedside nurse, as the nurse in the hospice, as the nurse at the hospital, as the nurse in the unit, wherever it is that you work, you give that high level care every single time so that you don't take away the experience from a family like I, I could have done here. Um, now this little quote here, a midwife should possess the hand of a lady, the eyes of a hawk and the heart of a lion. It's an old, um, and I don't have the annotation here, but it's an old saying that I think still rings true. I mean, that hand of a lady to me is about the gentleness that we approach families with, that we understand the sacredness of what they're allowing us to be a part of. The eyes of a hawk, that's our watchful nature as the one of the main things of our job is just to watch and make sure, watch and wait, sit on our hands a lot and be mindful of anything that needs addressing that could put um, a mom or a baby or a family in danger. And then the heart of a lion, and that is that passion and bravery to stand forth for, for the choices of the birthing family, for the choices of the woman, for the needs of your clients. That's what, to me, the life of a midwife is about. So it means different things every day, but at the heart of it is the caring, the concern, and the potential impact that you have. When you impact a woman, and I've known so many women that to me, during their pregnancy, were able to do things that they were never even considered themselves able to do before. Maybe they were able to leave a partner who was abusive or change their diet or stop smoking or shooting or snorting. They were able to do things because all of a sudden they could see beyond themselves a little bit. And to have the privilege of walking with them through those types of journeys that then impact your family, that then impact your community. That is a privilege and an honor. And so that's what I think life as a midwife is about. Now, however, getting there and sometimes even being there looks a little bit like this. In your mind, start and then finish. But life happens along the way. And our program is really designed to help support you through that. We know that life happens. We have a lot of flexibility built in um, so that you can increase or decrease the number of courses at a time you're taking. So <laughs> you can, if you have the need to sit out a term because of something going on in your life that you can do that. So we know that you are adult learners. We know that you have families. Many of you have um, extended families. Some of you, I always jokingly say, a lot of our midwifery students, um, they're going to school full time, they're working, they have four kids at home, they're homeschooling, a lot of you are homeschooling now. Their parents just moved in because their elderly parents need care, et cetera, et cetera. We know that, we know that. We have a, built a program that can help support you, but you just stay in contact with us so that we can give you good options. Now, here's who we are. I am the department chair. My name is Tanya Nicholson. I'm a nurse midwife and a nurse, women's health care nurse practitioner. And these people down here are just examples. We have Eileen Throwers, actually not on the picture there, but she's our clinical director. We have course coordinators and course faculty that work within all of our courses. We have regional clinical faculty that help you um, as you're in your clinical site. They help to, um, to be a liaison between you and the university and with you and your preceptor during your clinical experience. We have academic advisors that help during the coursework before you get into clinical. We have clinical advisors that help you to get ready to go to clinical and then help you while you're in clinical. They assist you with developing um, a, a, an approach to searching for a preceptor. Um, sometimes they help us with big agencies that we're trying to get students into. You're gonna have financial aid officer and then a credentialing coordinators that do help get the paperwork done, help to dot the I's and cross the T's so that when you go to your clinical site, it's ready and, and it's legal. And we like it like that. 
So we have a whole team. These are just some examples of some of our team that are available to you. We've got about um, more than 150 faculty, and I want to thank maybe 120 staff that are ready to help look after your needs, to help be a team for you to support your success. Because bottom line is, your success is our success. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to a nursing orientation where people said, look to your left, look to your right. Only one of you is going to get out of here alive or something like that. That's lunacy. We do not subscribe to that kind of thinking. Our thinking is that we're, we're here to support your success. That's what we want for you. That's what the women and the families need. Like one day, I don't anticipate it happening for many, many, many years, but there's going to be a day that I want to retire. And I need there to be lots of midwives in the mix ready to jump in and take my place. You know, you're here tonight because you're thinking about choosing to become a nurse midwife. It is an active choice. It means that you make choices along the way that help you to be successful. It means you have to take that first big step of um, applying. It means that you have to make hard steps along the way to make time and give yourself the space to do the work, the hard work that's required to becoming a midwife. But we have that same mission. So we're with you. I'm probably that, that big one in the front there. <laughs> we are with you. We are with you to support you, to guide you, and to push you forward sometimes at times. So as you look around at the people that are on the call today, some with cameras up, some not, these might be the people that are on mission with you as well. Um, we bring students in for an on campus, hopefully live soon again, knock on wood, experience of orientation. Currently we're doing it virtually, but that we hope soon to be back in person doing our um, frontier bounds is what we call them, it's our orientation. Then you do book work at home that prepares you. And a lot of that work involves um, working in simulated activities, working in exams and papers and all the things you would expect in school. And then you move into a time where you come back to campus and do a preparation to go into clinical. So it's like a clinical skills intensive. And then you move into your clinical and then completing things. As you are working through your educational process, one of the things that I want you to do is to allow yourself to think of things differently than you've thought of them before. And the example I would give to you is when I came to midwifery education as a student, when I came to be a student at Frontier, I told you I had never met a midwife, wasn't sure it was legal, had certainly never seen a birth that was um, a midwifery type birth. I had only worked in one hospital, so I had a very limited viewpoint of what I considered normal. In fact, I don't think I had ever seen a baby born to a mother without an IV on purpose. Now, some had walked off the elevator having their babies, right? And while I was so busy trying to get an IV in, I'm not sure that I was paying much attention to mom or baby. But what I learned in my midwifery education and then subsequently in practice is there are lots of ways to do things. There are lots of viewpoints. So expanding the possibilities for you as part of graduate education expanding your thinking, allowing yourself to look from different angles. So as we are, I'm gonna turn it over in a few minutes to admissions and let them answer some questions for you, but your actions and your words, like as you decide what you wanna be when you grow up. First, I think everybody should be a midwife. Let me just tell you that straight up. I think everybody should be a midwife. But it is a calling and it, it does bear a lot of responsibility but your actions and your words move you there. Like our responsibility is to give you the knowledge and the skills that you need so that you can become. And that's what we're always excited about. Your job, part of your job is to find ways to be resilient. Now resilience is not easy. Um, it's not easy to keep going when things get hard. It's not easy to keep going when there's been an emergency in your family or when there's some um, scary, horrible thing that's happened, or even sometimes when you're just tired, it's not easy to be resilient. But there's an element of resilience that's necessary to 
be able to um, persevere through education of any sort. You've already developed that. You've already demonstrated that in your nursing education. And you're going to have to pull that forward. Like, what were the things that allowed you to do that, to be resilient? Um, most of you probably experienced things during your nursing education that were not easy. How did you overcome those? Remember that so that you can do those same things again and again as you move forward through your uh, midwifery education. Now, I'm going to let you ask some questions about life as a midwife or a midwife student, and then we'll answer admissions type questions. Sorry, and that was another cool birth recently that I was in. So I'm going to take the presentation down for a minute so that you can see more of my face or less of my face if you want to make me smaller and um, give you guys a chance to ask some questions. I'm going to ask the other um, staff and faculty that are on the call to help me see questions if I miss them. But please feel free to unmute and just ask them. Do you mean I have answered all of your questions just intuitively? No, I have a question. When does the sem when do semesters generally smart start? Yes, we go to school all year. So we have four terms a year. Now our credit hours are semester hours that are designed to be played out in 11 week terms. So it looks like a quarter system, but the um, credit hours are semester hours. So that means that most people take either two or three courses at a time versus in a, a traditional semester system, you might take five or six. You're gonna take two or three courses at a time. The, the semester's terms generally start in January, April, July, and October. So we have a winter, spring, summer, fall terms. We go all the time in between each term. There's two and then usually one term a year, there's three weeks in between to give yourself a little breathing room before you start again. <clears throat> What else? The post um, graduate certification, because I have, I already have my master's in family nurse practitioner. Uh -huh. um, and I did that to be more marketable. Sure. However, I'm a 14 year labor and delivery nurse, and it is definitely a passion of mine. And that's why I want to go back. Is the post graduate like its own separate? term or like classes or do I kind of my classes kind of just fall in line with the That's normal correct because the content is the same right like you got to take for example newborn course or whatever you would not have to take the courses that are those building blocks that you've already taken like a patho and a farm as long as we can see that on your transcript you would not have to retake those and then you would just start in basically with the um, ma clinical management is what we call it, but it's not clinical yet. It's like the, man the clinical management, mental clin clinical management courses like antepartum, postpartum, newborn, et cetera, et cetera, and then go into clinical. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, and then as far as um, clinical hours, yeah. am I responsible of finding my own sites or does the clinical course kind of help? We work together. Stephanie, do you want to help answer that? Bye -bye. Oh, hey, little baby. That's for, I hear a sweet baby voice somewhere. I don't see it, but it's beautiful. Um, so Amy, to answer your question, the student is ultimately responsible to secure the clinical site and the preceptor. However, our unit, once you're admitted and enrolled in your first term of courses, you have available to you a vast uh, clinical site and preceptor network. We call that our community map. And the clinical advisors will meet with you one-on-one -on -one, um, to be able to decipher all of the resources on that map because we have, you know, over 10,000 sites and preceptors on that map that we've worked with in the past. So we already have a lot of contracts with sites and we already have a lot of preceptors credentialed. So we kind of point you in this path based on what your what your passions are. You know, what do you want your clinical experience to look like? We talked to you about that because students we like to help you tailor that the best way that you can and still complete your program plan on time so you'll work 
you know, in conjunction with the clinical advisors and your regional clinical faculty to build that clinical plan. And that starts as soon as you come to Frontier Bound, we're going to start talking with you about that and mm -hmm. uh, help you with that plan. So it'll look in individual for everybody, but um, certainly we want to help you as much along the way as, as you need. Okay, thank you. Here's a question in the chat. Um, I saw it pop up about labor and delivery experience. You do not have to have labor and delivery experience to become a midwife. I always um, just point back and say our obst obstetrician colleagues were not labor and delivery nurses before they became OBs. Now, is there value to the experience of being a labor and delivery nurse? Absolutely. There are skills that you're gonna have to learn to become a nurse midwife. And some of those skills are also skills that labor and delivery nurses have, like checking the cervix, reading a um, fetal monitor, et cetera, et cetera. But they're skills. They're skills that you can learn. So it is not um, that sometimes makes the clinical experience longer because you have to learn those things along the way too, but it does not keep you from becoming a nurse midwife. Other questions? I have a question. Um, I'm just wondering once, well, I have two questions. The first is about how long is the process? I know that there's different, um, you can do it two year, three year, but about how long is it where you do home study? And then at what point does it switch over to clinicals? Yes, the first, it's about almost half and half. It's a little more on the um, home study, the didactic book part, like usually one to two terms longer, but it's about, half and half for midwifery. And the reason I say that is midwifery sites are highly variable as far as how quickly you'll get done. So for example, if you came to my little town and you were with me as a nurse midwifery student, we're low volume site. So you're not gonna get a gazillion births on the day of call. You might get none, you might get one. But then there are other places if you went to um, a site I'm trying to think of one of our large um, volume sites. Well, in Ann Arbor, Mich is it in Ann Arbor? Anyway, there's a site in Michigan that's a very big site, very busy. You would get births done very quickly. So it's dependent upon the clinical portion is the most variable as far as how long it actually takes because of the variance in sites. Preclinical, it is completely dependent on whether you're taking two or three courses at a time. And is there like a certain amount of bursts that you have to attend? Is that what deciphers how long your clinical is? Yes, we have certain minimums of everything. So there are a minimum number of clinical hours. So for a master's student, the minimum number of hours is 675. For um, a postgraduate, it's 540. We have a minimum number of births, which is 40. There's a minimum number of GYN visits, of OB visits, et cetera. But it's a minimum because the bottom line is you have to achieve competency in the area. And so for some people, it's going to take more for, some, you know, but we have that minimum set. Okay. And so you can basically create your own schedule to where those, you know. Usually you're going to go with the schedule of the preceptor that you're with okay. because very often, um, you know, you'll have one or two or three preceptors, right? And then um, they're going to usually want you to be with them during their, you know, you, they're usually gonna say, you need to just follow my schedule. I, and I'm gonna add, ask, answer this before I forget. I see, is there a dual CNM WHUP program? It is not a dual program, but there is a midwifery program that then you can just finish and then add one additional course for women's health and be ready to sit for the women's health. And it's just a clinical course. The opposite is not true. If you do women's health first, there's a good bit of other work you have to do to finish midwifery. So if you know you wanna do both, mid, do midwifery first and then do women's health, it's shorter in time, a lot less money, and um, you know, you're prepared just the same, basically. Other questions? There's a question in the chat about, um, how many applicants do we accept and then also cost to complete that women's health completion program, Tanya, that you just mentioned? Okay, I don't know the number of applicants, but I can add, answer somewhat the other. The WHMP is one additional course if you have finished our midwifery program. It's one additional four credit hour course. 
So whatever the tuition is at the time, four credits of that. Currently for the spring term, uh, the tuition, the fee, everything is $3,322. For that one course? For, women's, that course. for the Women's Health Certificate uh -huh. Program. So for four credits, yeah. And it is not eligible for financial aid just because it is the one course. There was also a question of what aspects of the application uh, weigh the most heavily. I don't think you covered that yet. Um, I'm thinking about that. So I don't know that I can tell you like which one is weighed most heavily because it all matters. But we look at the GPA, we look at um, past nursing experience and even different types of nursing experience. There's some essays that we read as well. And then you also have your recommendations. Susan, am I missing anything? No, each piece of your application is looked at. They have a rubric that they use and they weigh each and every piece of your application, giving you an overall score. And I wouldn't say that one area is extremely more no, no, Definitely they look at your essays, they look at your professional references, they look at your experience, you know, they look at, they look at each and every piece, like, you know, they look at each and every applicant. Other questions? Yes, I have a question. Good evening. Um, I have two questions. Do you all touch on um, any global work if you are if a student is interested in that international work? Also, um, business development, like if you wanted to start a business. Okay, so I'm gonna, that's a two part question. I'm gonna start with the first part. Global health, we do not do a whole lot with because the goal of any accredited midwifery program, the primary goal is to equip you to be safe beginning level practitioners, which would be you know, practicing anywhere. But as far as specif specifically looking at global health, we don't do a whole lot of that. The business end, on the other hand, yes, we do quite a bit with the business end of it. It's one of the things I think that sets us apart in many ways from other programs. Um, we do have you take a American Association of Birth Centers How to Start a Birth Center workshop that even though the workshop is designed for birth center specifically, the information is translatable to other types of businesses. Open your own business, you need to understand the business behind um, a practice because the number one reason that midwifery practices close is that they're not physically sound. So you have to be able to maintain the business end of it and understanding some of that places you um, strategically to be able to contribute to a successful practice, whether you own it or somebody else owns it. So I think that's a really important piece of it. We also have a course within the curriculum that everybody takes that includes business um, pieces to it. Okay, thank you. And then my other question was, um, I was looking online at the reference, like how the references work. And I saw that you all email the reference di references directly. So I wanted to just be aware, is it something that they're going to be writing or are they answering questions? Is it a scale just so I can give them a heads up? Susan, you wanna answer that? You say that. Yes, what happens is when you put that in there, they're sent a form to fill out and it's, they, you know, kind of score you on the reference. And there are several essay questions that are asked as well. Okay, so they have like some time to, to answer those. It's not like, like, yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, they don't have to do it immediately, but they will need to complete it and submit it before your application is considered complete. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I had a question um, regarding uh, class structure. I had put it in the chat. Are the classes synchronous? Okay. Like say is the class at 4 p.m. and I have to log in um, or is it self-paced where you give me work and then I do the work? Yes, most of the um, coursework is self-paced. However, with a caveat, we are having more and more simulations within the courses, which are time and place um, specific. 
But generally what happens is there's a sign up at the beginning of the term, you sign up so you know when you've got to do that particular thing. It is not time and place like every Tuesday at four, it's not like that. But it is some elements of the courses may be time and place explicit. There are also um, some assignments within different courses that might require you to work within a group. So obviously you would have to meet with your group and that would require specific time and place, but that would probably be, be your group would decide what time. Um, let's see, did I answer all of your question there? Yeah, and I'm just kind of a offshoot of that question. Um, so are there like tests per se, like multiple choice where you're proctored or is it essay based or kind of I such a broad a combination okay, a, cool. there's a combination there's some writing within some courses there's some multiple choice exams that are proctored and then there's some simulated activities or case studies that are assessed in that way okay thank you you're welcome Dr. Nicholson, there's a yes. question in the chat regarding working while you're in the didactic portion of the program. And so I wonder if you could just speak on that and also just go ahead and throw in there the bonus of working while you're in clinicals while you're there. Sure. Um, we know that you all are adults and most of you will be working while you're in school. What I would say is this, and there, I think I saw a question about how many hours it takes to do the coursework. Um, we do a good, pretty good estimate of that. For somebody that's taking three courses at a time, it requires approximately 49 hours of study time a week. So look at your life. Are you sitting in front of the TV for 49 hours a week? If you are, then high five, you got this covered. Um, if not, then how would you make that space? Like you want to think about that. It may not be reasonable for your life. It may be that two courses is more reasonable. So I want, as you consider, you want to set yourself up for success and that's what we want for you too. So you've got to balance that work, the demands of school and life. So a lot of times people will think, okay, well, I'm working full time. That is three 12 hour shifts, which means I have four 12 hour days left to study. Well, the math might work there, but it only works if you do not have to um, wash any clothes, you do not have any children to look after, and you can study for 12 hours straight effectively, which is not really the way our brains work. We, we need you know a few three to four hours and then chill for a while and then do it again and et cetera. So don't, don't set yourself up like that. You know, what, what's then gonna happen to your life will just, disintegrate and fall apart if you have some little thing happen in the middle of it. So if you're working full time, most people would be better served to go to school um, and do two courses at a time. Now that's not, doesn't mean that's true for everybody. Some of you sitting here might be able to balance that beautifully, but give yourself grace in that and flexibility to figure out what actually works for you. So I think, I, and so the same is in clinical. What I would say about that is, remember you're going to nurse midwifery school and babies, guess when they come? Any old time, day, night, weekend, holiday, they don't care. And so what that means is you, and you're generally following your preceptor schedule. So most midwives work a good 40 plus hours a week. You are required to work in clinic at least 20 hours a week when you first start and the last term of clinical at least 30 hours a week. So you've got to arrange your life around that. And so that might mean if I were you, what I would do is um, save up as much vacation time, as much time off as I could so that I could use a lot of that during clinical. That is actually exactly what I did. I try not to take any time off um, prior to clinical time. And then when I got to clinical, I was able to work less and still um, take care of my family. But it's a balancing act. All of it's a balancing act. You know, you're not gonna, you can't, this is a very valuable thing that you're doing. Very valuable thing. So that means there's something to pay for it. There's time that has to be paid in to be able to achieve it. There's commitment that has to be paid in and tuition. So that was a joke, everybody laughed. <laughs> okay, next question. Unmute and ask a question. Um, I have a question uh, kind of on the same lines of clinical placement. 
Um, do you allow students or support um, like home birth atmospheres or only kind of birth center hospital based? Okay, it depends on the site. We do have some home birth sites that are used, but there are some restrictions around those as far as liability insurance and, it, and, and no um, home births for VBACs or multiples of breaches. So that we do have some home birth sites and we have some birth center sites within our um, guidelines. I saw a question, can Thank the you. amount of sources, courses, not sources, can the amount of courses vary? Yes, they can. Um, however, we have pre and co -recs. So you, if you bounce back and forth between two courses and three courses and one course and two course, too often you're going to end up in a place where you're like, oops, there's only one thing that I can take next term because I have to have that before I can do the thing after that. Our um, advisors, however, our academic advisors, <clears throat> pardon me, are really good at helping you with that. So let's say you signed up initially and took three terms the first three courses the first term and realized that was a bit much. Um, I need to take two next term, fine. Then you take two and then you're like, well, next term, everybody in the house is going to be doing X, Y, Z. So I will have more time and I could take three. Yes, we can move up and down like that as long as it's within the structure of the pre and co -recs being met. I have two questions. Um, okay. My first one is, uh, is is it common or does it happen that people get use different preceptors for different class? Like for example, just depending on what the, the specifications of a certain class are that there, there's one nurse midwifery you know, group near them that might specialize more in one thing or another, see a greater patient population like that. Do people change preceptors or do they stay with the same person the whole time? You just set me up beautifully for something that I really hadn't talked about. And that is that all of our clinical is done after all of the didactic coursework is done. Basically, there might be one class left, but by and large, you have completed all your coursework so that when you go into clinical, you can see any client. You can see somebody that's a GYN client or a postpartum client or a do a birth, et cetera. But yes, you can have more than one preceptor. And that's a really smart way to look at it. You know, who is the best person in your area? Who's the best midwife in your area? Try to get with them. But maybe they don't do much GYN. And so you might find another preceptor that does GYN. You don't have to stick, you don't have to have one preceptor. Some people do, and they have a great experience, but there's flexibility worked into the way that we set up our programs. Awesome. Thank you. Thank and you my for that. you just lobbied that right up to me. <laughs> Okay. Perfect. Um, my second question has to do with references for the application. Do you have a preference um, who they come from? Like, is it important to have a reference from your undergraduate education or do you care more about current um, managers or uh, do you have thoughts on that? I'm going to ask Susan if she has an opinion or Rainy. Do y'all have an opinion on that? We usually ahead, say two supervisors and one peer and what you want is someone to attest it to your skills as a nurse so that they can give the best perspective i do see a question here about how far from home are you allowed to go to do your clinicals you can go across the united states we don't care you can't go outside of the contiguous us but you can go anywhere else you want to you just have to have a nursing license for that state and I want to follow up with Susan on the reference. Um, so she, she did mention the supervisory or, you know, just looking at the website, um, the, the requirement is three references. You must be supervised, supervisory references. Some examples are nursing supervisor, supervisor, faculty from the applicant's nursing school and an MD, CNM, NP, PA who work with the applicant. Um, one can even be a professional peer. So I, don't, I hope that helps a little bit. And I'm going to read over some questions real quick in the chat that I think I do we offer mentoring and tutors. Um, we are setting up a mentoring program currently, and we offer tutoring in select courses um, for students who might be struggling in those courses. Um, another one is another. This is a across the board at this time. 
sorry, Tanya. Um, another one is, I know this is a distance learning program. However, are you able to go over with us having to be in person for the two sessions we are required to? And I believe they're referring to the frontier bound and the clinical bound. Yes, frontier bound occurs in the term before you actually start classes. It's literally an orientation. And it is um, at this time, starts on Monday evening and is done Wednesday evening. So it's two full days of activities. The clinical bound then occurs kind of, we call, it's almost like a little linchpin in between the didactic or book work and then the clinical work. So here you come back to campus and you do hands-on skills to learn how to suture, how to hold your hands during a birth, et cetera, et cetera. Currently we come in on Sunday night and we are done on Friday at lunchtime. Tiffany has asked about the pass rate for the board exam. Um, the pass rate is around, right around 90%, 85 to 92, it varies, from, varies up and down there. Um, it's routinely and has been consistently above the national average over the last, I don't even know how many years, a bunch of years. There were a couple of questions about um, a job as a nurse midwife and, you know, do most of our graduates work in private practices, hospitals, what are some typical oh job schedules, things like that, that maybe you could cover? Well, I can try, but I'll tell you, they're so variable that I could come up, you'll, you'll come up with somebody's example this, and I won't even have said it, but I'll tell you, I'll give you some examples. So there are a few jobs out there that are more hospitalists, meaning they're generally 12 hour shifts doing labor and delivery or triage. Those are very, very busy places. Um, not very likely to see those in more rural areas. Those are gonna be big, big hospitals because they need that much coverage to cover the labor floor. Um, most practices, let's say a practice that has three or four midwives in it, a practice like that would share the 24 seven call. So you might have one weekday that you're 24 hours call, and then you might do one weekend a month. And then in addition, you might do one to two office days if that's your schedule. Some midwives do five office days and cover call for their whole practice if it's a single midwife practice. Um, so it's so variable. You can see it would be dependent on a couple of things. One would be the volume in the practice so how much, how busy is the call coverage? Um, so like, obviously, if in a 24 hour call, you're likely to have five births, you're not gonna be working the next day, you're gonna be off. But in a practice like the one that I'm in here in Georgia, it's a rural area, I, we're very likely to be scheduled, would be very likely to be scheduled for office the next day because it's not, we might have only one um, birth or none during the 24 hours. So it's highly variable dependent on the volume in the practice, the number of providers in the practice and the type of practice. So let's say it's a birth center. Many times birth center volume is lower. So it might be that the um, birth center midwife might own the practice and there might she might be the only midwife or there might just be two. So she would see patients in the office a couple of days a week because that would be enough office slots to see everybody but be on call, she might be on call every week or every other week um, back and forth with her partner. So that those are just a few of a gazillion examples. As many ways as you can imagine it, you might see it. Other questions? I'm going to read some questions in the chat. Okay. There's one, how right. does it work with getting this degree from the state of Kentucky, but then working in our home state? Is it just determined by the board exam that we sit down to take to get a license in our home state? The midwifery boards are a national um, board exam, just like your NCLEX um, exam is. So the exam is nationally recognized. Licensure is different, just like your NCLEX would be honored everywhere. You still would have to apply for a license in any place that you move to. You would have to ask for reciprocity or whatever. This is similar situation. So the exam is national, but your license within your state. Is that the Was that the question? Did I answer it? 
Let me scroll back up here to it. Yes, yeah, says. I think so. Is it just determined by the board exam? And another one is to get our license in our home state. I, yeah, you get your license in your home state and each state has different um, spec specifications, just like nursing. And also, um, it's not all under the Board of Nursing. There are some states that midwifery is under the Board of Nurse, uh, Med Medicine. There is, I think, at least one state that has a Board of Midwifery, and but most nurse midwifery um, licensure is under Boards of Nursing, but it varies from state to state. And in your first role course, we cover a lot of that. We help, we send you out to go find out about your state so that you then know what to do later. Other questions? All right, I'm gonna share my screen, just a couple more slides. Sorry. So we, I think we've gotten most of our admissions questions. If anybody has any, you can put them in the chat or unmute. Now here's the thing, this is just reality. It, this isn't easy, but nothing really good is very easy. And so there are going to be things that you do right, things that you do wrong. You're going to work hard, and you can do this if you choose to. Um, midwifery is one of the biggest blessings in my life. It is probably surpassed only by my three boys. And I constantly say when I'm at a birth and they're like, you act like you love this. I'm like, I absolutely love it. The only thing I like better is kissing my own boys, my own grown children. So, um, so you go towards success, like each step, make sure that each step that you take is moving you in the right direction. This is just some, you can go to frontier.edu for some more information, but we want to encourage you, like if you just been on the fence, like, should I do this? Is this the time? Um, for such a time as this, this is the time. You can do it. Um, we will help support you. We will do everything we can to make your experience good and successful. You got to put your part into the pot and we'll put our pot into the pot and hopefully we'll stir it all up and out with my midwife. Um, there's a question about why you cannot work on the same unit where you do clinicals. So I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. The Cliff Notes version is, if you think about it, let's think about it from a liability perspective and from a role perspective. If today in the office, um, I was the midwifery student and saw Stephanie as the, hey little sweet baby, and saw Stephanie as the um, pregnant woman, let's say. So I saw her in the office and in her mind, I am her midwife. I'm acting in the role of midwife there. And then that night on labor and delivery, I'm working triage and she comes in thinking she's in labor. But my role there is as a nurse, not as the midwife. She's asking me questions as the midwife that I can't answer because I'm now the nurse. And then let's suppose, Lord have mercy and let's hope it doesn't ever happen, but there's a bad outcome and now your name is on the chart as the midwife student and then as the nurse. That's a lot of liability that's weird. And it is a lot of role confusion for the patient. And, so, and actually, to be honest, for you too, it's hard to be the midwife to somebody today and tonight to be the nurse or vice versa. Um, especially, let's say the person that's on, let's say you were the nurse that night. And if you were the midwife, you would have wanted to do X, Y, Z, but the person on call is not you. And they are going to do ABC. And maybe you agree or don't agree. And you, this patient has placed their trust in you. So we just, that is just not a good set up. I hope that helps a little bit. Does that help with that question maybe? I hope. Um, any other questions before we close? You guys have been, you guys have rocked it. Thank you for being with us. We want to make sure, and we're available, like we're not disappearing off the face of the earth once we turn this um, off. So let's see, what if you were to That, um, Anissa, we would have to, we might, we would have to talk about it. You can't, the main thing is labor and delivery. Um, that's the main thing. So if you have an individual, 
circumstance, we can we talk about those and help try to work through them and figure out alternatives or the best way to do things. Because we want our goal is for you to be successful and get done. The in, you know, liability insurance is covered through the university while you're a student with us. Ah, I love that. What do we think are the advantages? We have a long history of making nurse midwives. We're the oldest continuous running midwifery program in the United States. Um, we are the largest midwifery in the United midwifery program in the United States. And while you know, you might say, "Well, I would rather have a small program where I get to know people," I totally understand that. But we bring to, I'm gonna tell you that I think the biggest advantage that we have is we have more than 50 midwifery faculty. And if and of those, when you look at those 50 midwifery faculty, we have more than 490 years of practice experience, more than 180 or something like that of practice as nurse educators. And think about the variety of that experience from all across the United States. Many have worked across the world in all types of practices in all type, with all types of women and families. So when we start to work on a course or work on a curriculum, you're not limited by my limited experience. Your experience is not limited by my limitations. But we pull all of that wide, deep experience of our faculty to help make sure and deliver the best program that is possible to you. I would say that is our very most wonderful um, benefit that you get to tap into the minute you're a frontier student. So there was a question about tours of campus. Unfortunately, we are not doing any tours of campus, but we hope to have an open house this fall. <laughs> you can watch our uh, social media um, once we start promoting that and maybe you can attend that. We do have some photos and um, I think there's a web page we can link to Brittany right that has just an update on what's going on with the campus right now for those that you know, yes. we, we're not even there right now so we have to follow along. <laughs> we have to follow along too, just like you all. That's campus. Can you see that. Do y'all see my is do you have my do I have my campus picture behind me one of them. All right, hold yep. on. Here's the entrance. That's campus. A rendering of the entrance. <laughs> That's campus. There you go. That's campus. Look at there. You ask, you shall receive. Virtual, virtual tour virtual happening Virtual right tour now. right here. I do want you all to know that Dr. Nicholson is a midwife extraordinaire and educator extraordinary, but, but she has tons of talents. And once you all come to Front Bound, you'll get to know about many of them. She is a hostess with the mostest. She can sing like a bird, all kinds of things that you'll get to suture. learn. About. You can, she can suture with blindfolded. I mean, it's amazing. Thank you guys for being here tonight. Thank you so much. I hope this was helpful to you. I hope to see you all soon at an orientation. I hope you all decide to apply and become midwives because midwives rule. And um, thank you. Thank you for being with us. We got one more question. One more question. I'm sorry. Um, for in terms of um, getting into clinical without um, necessarily being a labor and delivery nurse, I do have some labor and delivery experience, but I've been primarily a, an adult critical care nurse for mm -hmm. 10 plus years. Um, do you find that nurses who are outside of the labor and delivery like foundation, do you find that they still are generally as successful as um, other nurses as kind of catching up and, and being... Uh, yes, I think, I mean, there's a catch up period. I would be lying to you if I didn't say, hey, you got to learn those things. But yes, in fact, and she doesn't mind me telling it, one of our faculty members, Megan Garland, who is exceedingly successful in her professional life, she's won some big fancy pants, something or another um, at Rush. And she was, she was not a labor and delivery nurse. And she had like, she had to work hard during her clinical. Like she had to work a little longer than other people, a little harder. I hired her in her first practice job in Winter Haven, Florida. She had a very hard first year. The first year was hard to make the adjustment. She had to earn the trust of the labor and delivery nurses who inevitably are gonna think you can't be a you know, midwife without having been, you know, we, you know how nurses are. Um, she had to earn their trust. 
She did. She worked there for several years. When I moved to the university, I hired her here. And I always jokingly say, if I ever go anywhere else, I'll try to hire her there because um, she's a wonderful midwife who brings such, she brings other things. Like you you don't, may not have labor and delivery experience, but I bet you've got other things that you would be bringing to the role that I might not have or that somebody else might not have. Um, so yes, I think that the success, and there's a, are you, oh yes. My, my son lives in Winter Haven. I'm about to go there tomorrow night to see my baby. Um, the, I think what you will hear and the look, there was a study, it's been several years, but there was a study about success in practice and, um, the success in practice is the same. Like, I think the first year, probably there's a learning curve still in practice, but I bet you by year two and three, everything's on an even playing field. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome.